Good morning again. I want to talk about courage this morning. And my comments this morning are going to kick off a series of uh, services, sermons, homilies that I'm going to do throughout the rest of the summer on various aspects of courage. I hardly ever do sermons in a series, uh, but I have been moved lately by the courage that I have seen in these times of COVID and of civil unrest. And I've been moved also by what I believe is the need for courage from all of us um, in these very troubled and uncertain times. So I'm going to begin with a teaching story. Um, this comes from Ethiopia. A long time ago, there was a woman in a certain village who had adopted a boy whose parents had died of a disease. She had no children herself, and she really desperately wanted this young boy to love her as a mother. The boy, however, was still grieving for the parents that he had lost uh, and was uh, sullen and would even barely even look at her, even when she brought him his food. She thought she would ask advice from a wise healer in a neighboring village and uh, whether there was some magic that could be done that could make the child love her. She went to that uh, wise healer in the next village and that woman told her, there is a special drink that I can make for you, a magic potion, which will, you can give to the boy and when he drinks it, he will love you as his own mother. Oh, please make this for me, the woman said. The healer raised a finger and said, wait, this is a very difficult potion to make. It requires the whisker from a living lion. The woman's heart raced upon hearing this. Lions are ferocious. Lions are dangerous. What a fearful task you have given me. But she thought about the boy and said to herself, I will get this whisker. And away she went. The next afternoon, she took some meat to a pond where there had been some lion tracks seen. She put the meat by the water and she hid behind a tree to wait. And sure enough, at dusk, a lion came to the water and saw the meat there. And she knew, by the way, the lion lifted his head and sniffed the air. She knew that the lion knew she was there hiding in the bushes. But he was satisfied with the meat and did not bother her. The next evening, she did the same thing. And the lion sniffed the air, but again did not approach her, was happy with the offering. She then the next evening, she did the same thing, but instead of hiding in the bushes, she just merely crouched in the path where the lion could clearly see her. And the lion did look at her long, and she was afraid. Um, but again, the lion left her alone and ate the meat. She did this every day for a couple of months. And at the end of this time, the, uh, she would be at the point where she could leave the meat on the ground and wait just, a, just five or ten feet away. And the lion would come and look at her and take the meat and then go away. After three months, there came a night when the woman placed the meat on the ground and then did not move at all. Stayed right there. And when the lion approached the meat, he sniffed her, growled a little bit, and then lowered his head to eat the meat. And right when he did that, she reached out and plucked a whisker from his face. The next morning, the woman ran back to the village, to the wise healer, and said, Look, I have the whisker from a live lion. Please make me this potion. The healer said, you are extraordinarily brave, but you don't need any potions. You have learned everything you need to be with this boy who is in your charge and have, her, have the boy come to love you. You have learned everything you need. You don't need any magic drink. You have demonstrated patience, and courage, and you have not run away. And when the woman went home, she found that she could think of the boy as a lion. 
and approach him with the same patience and the same respect and the same uh, and, and not run away from the hard parts. And eventually, in fact, the boy did come to love her as his own mother. So like all good teaching stories, this one contains many, many levels of symbolism. But let me try to apply it to our times. White people like me, and like many of you, are being asked, well, actually, good people are demanding that white people like me and like many of you be part of, step up and be part of the solution to systemic racism that is America's original sin. Racism is a pervasive reality in this country in every conceivable and every measurable way. You know most of this. From education to entertainment, from job opportunities and compensation and the associated wealth disparities and at least most publicly for right now, racialized policing and racialized police brutality. Our own Racial Justice Project and the Front Range Faith Leaders for Racial Justice group, which I convene, is compiling lists of ways for any and all of us to be involved, to make a difference, and we will be publishing that list probably next week. But I shared the story of the lion's whisker because I think it illustrates a healthy way to think about and stay engaged in this faithful work. It's going to require patience. It's going to require some courage, and it's going to require us to not run away or turn away. Because not all of us can go to protests or testify at congressional hearings or anything near that public, but, but we can all be willing to learn in depth the truth of American history and the conditions that have been imposed on black and brown citizens for 400 years. We can, all of us, we can be open to learning about white supremacy culture and how that culture infects, and I use that word not lightly or accidentally, how that culture infects our thinking, our worldview, and our national dialogue. We can all be open to learning more deeply how that culture excludes people and hurts people. We can be willing to stay in difficult conversations and emotionally stay with our own complicity and we can be open to learning from that. And it will take patience and it will take courage and it will take not running away or turning away or pretending that this is anything other than what it is. In the coming weeks during services that I will be um, leading or doing the homily for, I'll be speaking on different aspects uh, or areas of courage. I'll be speaking about um, moral courage and spiritual courage, intellectual courage, physical courage, social courage, emotional courage. And especially, I think, going into the inevitable ugliness of the coming election cycle, we are all going to need all the courage and all the clarity we can get. Most importantly for today, I want to acknowledge and I want to thank you, First Unitarian Denver, for being a courageous congregation. You have demonstrated over and over again your willingness to take risks and be brave, to have hard conversations and to love and support each other even when you disagree about very important matters. Hardly ever in the 18 years that I've been your minister have I ever had to say to myself, yeah, I probably better not talk about that. Because my experience is that I can get up in front of you on any given Sunday morning and I can wrestle with just about anything. Painful issues, complex issues, and I can be as deeply honest as I'm able. And I can invite black speakers and speakers of color from the community and I tell every one of them when they agree to speak here, I say, don't hold back. Just bring your whole self, bring your whole message. Tell them like it is, they can take it. 
And you have stuck right there with them and with me. Uh, and I am, I am grateful for this. Our times are calling us as a faith community to be brave and to be patient and to not run away. And it will be dangerous and it will be stressful and it will require us to admit things we would probably rather not admit and deal with things we would almost certainly rather not deal with. And together, we will remember together that just like the woman in the story, we are motivated by love. And together we will remember that together we are stronger than we could ever be as people in isolation. And we will remember that we, if we stick together, we can face anything and we will be patient and we will be brave and we will not turn away. So stay tuned. Much more is coming over the coming weeks and months. Remember what Mother Teresa once said, and I'm going to close with this thought. Not all of us can do great things, but all of us can do small things with great love. Amen.